it takes a, like a, a very wide global space, but also I think it's important um, to remind um, the audience that, that there are people who have been working also on this issue for a long time. Maybe, you, of course, we have younger people that you know that they've, they've done like new research and, and new chapters, but many of the other people, or other, other contributions, so you understand how, how it was originated, you know, it comes from other, you know, other groups of researchers that we've been working, for example, on the Mexico-US border or in Mediterranean borders, but more, for more than a decade, most of them, or, or that have been in projects together before, maybe with other languages. We had to like, a, for example, an old book of a, the Rio Bravo Mediterranean, the Rio Bravo Mediterranean, that was like um, more than 10 years ago. So some of the, the people were already there. So it's like they're standing on this kind of research. No? So that's, it's like a, a long-term observance of the, of the research, no? most of them. Other ones, you know, like I had to find them because uh, I didn't have, for example, a, a, rep a good representation maybe of uh, all, the chat all the parts of the world, for example, some parts that were completely new to me, Burundi or, I didn't know anybody who was working in Burundi. I had to look, you know, like, but all the people were coming from this, you know, like a, a long-term research on the on Mediterranean, US, America, US, Mexico borders. We, in this uh, book, we can find many examples in uh, that map different aspects of a structural violence in one of the, in the world's most contentious borders, highlighting uh, the forms and the practices that connect with labor exploitation, legal exclusion, and a severe absence of human rights. So we have many of these examples in global borders, and we, we draw attention to the forms and spaces of resistance of these sites available to migrants and activists, contemplating how they advocate and, and, and provide human security to those who are subject to border violence. We offer empirical analysis of critical border regions. And uh, the, like the first part is the example of the US-Mexico border regions, but also the Mediterranean border regions and borders in Southern America and Eastern Europe, in Central Africa, the Middle East, and the U UK Ireland division. So this uh, book, provides a truly transnational approach to borders and migration, demonstrating the dynamic asymmetric relationship between the social structure of border enforcement and the human agency of the migrants and activists themselves in these border sites. So it's very important to see how it, through the research, all the chapters or most of the chapters focus on people, on on migrants and, 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 the, and, and the people who work with migrants in this border site. And they observe the ability to navigate social structures designed to subordinate these people. And, and, and they look and they broader human rights consequences of these efforts. We examine specifically, I don't know if you're aware of this uh, kind of a politics or the terminology of this concept, the, what is called designated as the politics of compassion, which is like a critical hierarchical relationship between the helper, just to say very abstractly, I know, between the helper and, and the help. So how, it's, how do we work with this complex help and helper uh, relationship in this kind of border settings? And and, and how we do understand human dignity in this kind of relationships. That's a, a many chapters really do reflect on these kind of questions. Thus, our focus here, that is very important to underline, is about the clash. That's uh, one of the most important ideas of the book, is a, a, on the clash between the human security of migrants in human rights terms, the, this human security, and the state power in border regions, which relates to national sovereignty, and the many ways this plays out in a remarkable 
a way of case studies around the world. So of course, as I said, we use first the iconic US-Mexico uh, uh, border and then the Mediterranean border area, but we extend it to other areas in the world. So we look, uh, for example, uh, apart from the Mexico, US and Mediterranean, we have other cases that they include the political economy and repression, for example, of violent expulsions in Myanmar. Amazonian borders of Brazil, Burundi, the Central African Republic, as well as the migration of African women to Europe, and the experiences of migrant children in Iran, migrant children from Afghanistan in Iran, as well as in the Western Mediterranean. In addition, the, the, the project, the, the book, case examines the formation of fluid shifts in the enforcement of borders of Macau, Hong Kong, Crimea, uh, Crimea with, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, and Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the, and the impact on people. Across all these kind of uh, uh, case studies, we see the extraordinary perseverance and creativity of migrants, activists, and residents in border regions to assert the humanity in the face of doubting human insecurity imposed and exacerbated by state border enforcement structures. We see here the deeply human face of migration confronting the state and indirectly corporate and financial powers in a plethora of contemporary border regions and migration because we don't have so much time and there's so many things to say about the book in the introduction. It's like a very long introduction itself, but uh, I would just to, you know, select uh, a few paradoxes that we, you know, we see at the conclusion of these case studies. I think uh, I could reflect in four important uh, par uh, paradoxes of these, uh, of these chapters, but I will just, explain too, because uh, otherwise it would take so much time. I pointed out four paradoxes. So it was like the mobility paradox, the humanity humanitarian paradox, the border control paradox, and the inequality paradox. I would just, you know, like uh, stop in the first two ones, the mobility paradox and the human and humanitarian paradox. The first one is uh, what's happening to mobility itself and mobility in border areas uh, today. Mobilities today are easier, well, you see, uh, before COVID, easier and simultaneously harder with emerging also nationalism, populism, and now pandemic measures. In general, according to mobility filters, mobility filters in border areas, which use long running ethnic and racial profiling, it gets today particularly harder for asylum seekers, lower class migrants and populations from the global south. But paradoxes can be reflected in many scales. There's a problem also of scales in these border areas. Territorial subdivisions and geographic borders are also essential here for the understanding phenomena in in sociology, political socio uh, science, geography, history, and economics, we have to consider this kind of a scale um, observance in order to understand. In our in all these case studies, we have selected many cases at the same time, many many scales of influence, regions, cities, neighborhoods, communities themselves. Some region, some regions have had a wide coverage or there's less, of course. In such an observance of a scale, we focus on regional patterns of migration also. In, in the, we focus also on the triple borders, they call it the triple borders, as it happens, for example, with the case of Chile or in the case of uh, the Amazons, where there are three countries connected in the same time in a border area. We focus also on the colonial powers defining the borders, for example, in the case of Macau. We focus also on the Amazon as the configuration of the complex ecological border today. 
transformation and governance is shown in one of the most important transporter regions of the planet, the Amazon, the huge cosmopolitan frontier. Such a scale, such observance of a scale makes us also not only think about regions and, and, and bigger institutions, but of course, it makes us also think about communities in how the separation with the same people or people think as being the same people is constructive. We have it, for example, in the cases of Ireland, in the case of Cameroon, or, the, or also in the different anti-Latino policy along the US borders with both Mexico and Canada. And also as in the Martin chapter in the construction of the foreign neighbor in a small Catalan town. But who are these actors? Who are the actors of these mobilities? In many cases, in these chapters, we have, they have been minors, children, and women. For example, we emphasize the youngsters' agency role in the Western Mediterranean, especially in the case of Morocco, or in the case of the Afghanistan border to Iranian cities, with, the, with one of the examples of Tehran in the book. How, which is a very, I don't say many examples, but this example I tend to say also many times is with the case of teenage children from Afghanistan working in solid waste recycling in Tehran, which is a huge phenomenon, phenomenon in, the, in the capital of Iran. All the important actors are also returnees in Latin America and Western Africa. It is shown through the impact of the permanent crisis in the Central African Republic on Cameroonian return migrants. The children are especially selected as being those where the confusions around moral agency is more blatant. Poor children, minority children, foreign children, children of immigrants. This is why the situation as children normally responds to advocacy interest in border areas. And then the second paradox out of the four, and we'll finish with, uh, with this paradox, the paradox of humanity and the humanitarian. Human rights, we know, as we said, they are very important. They are additionally precarious at the borders of a state, as this tends to be a space where the state sovereignty and security needs to needs tend to trump to trump excuse me, civilian and individual rights and liberties. Through many of the security concerns in the case of borders between rich and poor nations. And now it comes a humanitarian actor here. Humanitarian relief efforts and refugee support services are usually based at the border. And this create an entirely different form of cross-border networking and flow of people and goods. Within these borders, how does civil society organize such complex responses? How does the state violate the right of migrants in the midst of pervasive border controls and wall constructions? And here we have, I think, three elements to understand this paradox. One is violence. Is violence the paradigmatic concept in the second paradox? Such proliferation of expulsions and violence makes us go beyond the mere description of the border violence. However, the real research task here is to identify predatory formations which are dressed in pretty robes, as Sassen calls them. The concept of violence, for example, uh, by one author, by Heyman, through two types of violence, open violence in Mexico, hidden violence in the US through an articulation of physical, mental, and structural violence. But often we obscure what is behind violence also, as many other authors work on. Another, another element of, um, of this paradox is, for, is the idea of um, 
uh, compassion, a second concept of this paradox is compassion itself in the humanitarian. Exploring compassion provides insights in how to some groups come to be included in circles of concern while others remain excluded. Why do good people, that's a good question and complex one, why do good people turn a blind eye to the suffering of strangers? Why, uh, how does, uh, how this emotion of the, of the suffering works? How does all these politics of compassion work? How, how do we understand this humanitarian assistance that comes after compassion? It, well, it's a very untangled question that I'm really very interested uh, on and I'm working on a lot uh, these days. So um, thirdly, and this uh, kind of paradox is necropolis necropolitics, mourning and death, death in the, the Mediterranean and horrorism. Necropolis crosses many chapters of the project of the book by referring especially to the words of the uh, academic Mbembe from the book in 2003. Horrorism is also there. Horrorism is then what we find beyond violence to underline the dispersonification of victims, their vulnerability and their condition of being unarmed that we can see in many examples in the chapters, in the cases of Mexico, in the cases of Turkey, in the case of Italy, etc. And then I said there were all the two other paradoxes with the border controls and border policies and inequality, but just we just leave them uh, aside not to be able to talk so much. And I just tell something about the table of contents <laughs> and finish with, with uh, my presentation. And the book is uh, divided in, in five parts. So the first part is, as I said, the iconic US-Mexico border region and uh, the answers, you know, like include militarization of the border with Tim Dunn, I think he will tell something about that himself afterwards. With a, well, I, pro I probably, I won't say names because we'll never finish. I'll just say topics without names now. Then uh, the, con the concept and the practice of violence at the border, the, the precariousness of, of mantling and dismantling camps in the border. Etc. That's the part of the Mexico US region. Then the second part, I call it on uh, we call it on the on the way to the US, but maybe it's not so perfect that title because Chile is not on the the, the example of Chile, for example, in the triple border, it's not people that they are going to the US, but most of this part is kind of a Central America, Latin America with an eye on the on the US, but sometimes it's not so perfect the mm -hmm. correspondence. So First, it's uh, the you know the the, the this concern the, the this form of expulsion of migration that uh, happens in in um, in Central America. You know, it's like a they, they, like the they have very insecure societies. So mm -hmm. this connection in with expulsion from your own security from everything, and uh, and the way to the U.S. You no, know, it's uh, by assassin. Then there's a chapters on security, all the, the, all, all the concept of, of the new security, how we understand security, which is so important to, to think about the border today, you know, like a, the, the new concepts on security, the privatization of security, et cetera, all these new challenges that they are posed in society to security. Then uh, again, necro necropopulism uh, through medical lenses, in the cases of Turkey and Mexico, and then uh, the situation of uh, the migrant um, migrants coming back to to Guatemala, but spelled migrants which are spelled to Guatemala and how they are treated by their own societies, which is the, the same the same happens in, in the case of uh, Central Africa. It's, it's, it's so, mm -hmm. but not many. This, not many people are researching on, on this kind of situation and, and really they, they are like people left 
left over from all societies. Mm -hmm. huh? And then uh, uh, the case of the of the Chile triple border, Arica Tacna border, and that now it's there's, there's many things are happening like uh, now with all the Venezuelan migrants, etc. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Then a third part on the Mediterranean, it's like a first, a theoretical, critical, uh, long dure perspective uh, by Palida, thinking about what the uh, uh, global, um, uh, globalization today and what it means in this, in understanding Mediterranean migration. Then there's uh, other research on uh, how through images, in the images of telephones, etc., you know, in an anthropological setting, you know, Syrian refugees are uh, claiming their own rights with these videos and photographs, etc. Then uh, one by myself about the, the Mediterranean and Libya and the condition of a of a of women passing that border. Mm -hmm. Then uh, on Spanish migration policies and. Uh, in the rise of the right wing, say quickly. Then uh, another a chapter on Israel, on uh, excuse me, on on Gaza, on the Gaza Strip and the construction of tunnels, and what it means in the circulation of people and and uh, goods, etc. Then there's another one uh, about the Spanish-Algerian uh, border in a long-term perspective, and then there's a chapter by Martin. I won't talk about this one. Part five, part four is uh, regions, partitions, and edges. This one uh, about Myanmar, one about Burundi, the one about uh, the Amazon. The Amazon is called blood, smoke, and cocaine. They, they touch many things in that chapter. The border in Macau, the Crimean case, and the Irish border. And then part five is the last uh, part. It's called violence and containment approaches to youth and gender. There's uh, the situation of Af African women passing to Europe, but with an interpretation of the, how, you know, like a, a symmetry is straight into your own body. So it's like a connection with a, with a, a body interpretation in, a, in an anthropological context. Then there's a crisis in Central African Republic and the, pushing back of a uh, Cameroonian returnees, the case of Afghanistan border and, and, uh, and the children in Tehran, and the last case of the teenage mobilities in the Western Mediterranean, and how they are a, a, a real a extreme case of, about how border regimes are working today. And then the last, the last, uh, chapter is not a chapter, it's more like an afterword. It's like a, you know, it's like a visualization of different maps done by a, a Portuguese colleague, but in a very abstract way, putting all these kind of cases together in a general world mapping or regional mapping. Well, there are different maps. I can leave it here afterwards. So that's all. Uh, I would just only to finish, thank you, because thank you, I mean, uh, Team that, Timothy Dan and myself, we've, we've packaged these ideas together and tried to do our best. But of course, I mean, there are so many people so, uh, working on this book. I think it, it would be important to, to thank you. I would just say the names very quickly. And with this, I would say finish. Aladini, Bejarano, Boyce, Cabezon Fernandez, Camps Febre, Carter, Correa, Denaro, Dun. Dan, excuse me, Fernandez Suarez, Gaynor, Gomez Diaz, Hayward, Hernandez Sanchez, Hyman, Iturra Valenzuela, Jimenez, Kasner, Komarova, Riri, Langstein, Malleiros, Mazuni, Melo, Miller, Mirzei, Nieto Olivar, Navone, Palida, Sandoval, Sassen, Sempere, Solis, Suma, Tobón, Wehling, Yambeni Mugono. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, should we maybe, I mean, 
maybe Tim, you'd like to say a few words now that we have the pleasure of having you here. Uh, Timothy Dunn is a professor at the University of Salisbury. Are you here with us, Tim? Yeah, probably just have uh, to. She's here. Yeah, you can unmute yourself, all right? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's good. Is that a good? Okay. Yeah, it's good. Thank um, you, Martin. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think um, Natalia uh, overviewed it, the book very, very well, uh, bringing out a lot of the key issues we're trying to highlight that are illustrated in, in the great uh, range and diversity of case studies. Um, I really think we were able to illustrate well, the the um, the tensions and the this asymmetrical but dialectical relationship between the um, the human agency of the of the migrants and of of people assisting them and humanitarian groups um, in facing uh, very uh, you know great levels of state power and um, and other uh, corporate power at times as well uh, directly and indirectly. Uh, and the power of, of uh, illicit actors that are preying on the people as well uh, in, in organized crime sorts of settings. Um, and so there's just so many um, different ways you can kind of line up how the, the people are playing in different roles, but that, that asymmetry between the social structure of border enforcement and the power behind it of nation states or, or transnational organizations in the case of the EU, and the human agency of people struggling to make a better life. And, and thinking of this, not just in terms of national security as, and, and the securitization of migration as issues as, as often put forward in policy circles, but also human security of the, the people involved in migration and the people aiding them. And, and how we don't reflect on, on that very much in these policy discussions, uh, except as an afterthought. I come at this from looking at you know, 30 years of research looking at the U.S.-Mexico border region, having uh, chronicled its buildup and militarization um, very, you know, in, in great detail as one of the, as it became, uh, Natalia said, you know, kind of an iconic uh, case study. And the, the U.S. process of doing this to address complex uh, geopolitical issues, economic development issues, uh, and, you know, the, the fallout from wars in the, in the region in Central America, particularly people coming through Mexico, um, the now climate issues uh, and, and food security issues and, and environmental damages. You know, we see that being developed and it is really the US has exported that model of border control to the European Union and, you know, many allies in developing countries around the world, right? The model of building up all these uh, various border resources mm -hmm. to uh, try to repel people or keep them out, or if they come in to keep them in a highly subordinated uh, quasi underground position. And this becomes a big kind of an extension of the military industrial complex. It becomes the border security industrial complex, which uh, many of the same, you know, corporate actors providing these resources, many of the same organizational principles from military and paramilitary settings come to infuse what was really a policing issue and where security uh, issues are not as prominent typically. Particularly in the US-Mexico border case, there are very few security issues, really. It's mostly uh, just people coming to work and people fleeing persecution. There has been no terrorism threat come across the US-Mexico border ever um, apprehended thus far. And uh, other types of security problems are principally generally just regular uh, crime problems. And in fact, our border region on the US side has the lower crime rates than other parts of the US. So, you know, all the so called uh, hyping up of the dangers and the extreme problems of migration kind of crystallizing in the border region for a lot of political propaganda purposes at times, um, this kind of demonization of the other that 
Donald Trump took to new heights, but which others certainly have practiced as well before him, uh, you know, is, is largely unfounded. There's just no real security threats there. And there is this enormous amount of flow of people back and forth legally as well that gets obscured, but it is also difficult for all to come who have a reason to come. And so the, the slowing down of the visa process, the blocking of the asylum process and so on is, you know, part of that struggle. And, you know, I think we were able to um, give attention to people's research, really documenting that and getting into those issues to show what the human face of, of some of this is. Uh, and people's just extraordinary. Uh, I can't emphasize enough, you know, reading people's work and editing it was just so moving to see the extraordinary lengths that people go to and the incredible, incredibly creative <clears throat> human agency they express to, to try to make a better life for themselves or to help others to do the same. And again, in the face of these overwhelming odds, um, it just shows that the policymakers tend to underestimate the <laughs> real human security needs of people in these conditions and, and their motivations and that they will go to you know, nearly any length to try to um, make a better life for themselves and to survive. And, you know, no amount of throwing up border walls and resources to stop them is really going to do the job unless we better focus would be to try to address their human security needs, both in their home countries where many of our powerful nations like the U.S. have a direct foreign policy role, uh, such as most dramatically in the wars, but also in economic policy, and in their route Wrote of travel and in their arrival to core, you know, wealthy nations. So I'll just uh, leave it at that in very broad terms. But thank you very much for the event, and and um, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to do this and for the great overview from Natalia. I look forward to hearing more about your chapter as well, Martin. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, meanwhile, we have uh, we've had the. Uh... Uh, last minute connection from Saskia, yeah. So I'll I'm just, here. I'm here. <laughs> so I'll just yes. send you uh, Saskia, and and then I'll leave you to to your contribution. Uh so Saskia Sassen is, as you know, uh, Robert Deslin, Professor of Sociology at Columbia University, and a member of the Committee on Global Folk, which is chair uh, chair to 2015. She's the author of eight over eight books and the editor of co-editor of three books among um, one the one that you're you you're preparing together, Natalia and Saskia. Um, um, she has re received many awards and honors, uh, among them multiple Dr. Horner's Causa, the 2013 Principe of the Asturias Prize in the Social Science that led him to the Royal Academy of the Sciences of the Netherlands, and made a Chevalier de Lourdes de Sartes in Lourdes and Letters by the French government. Sassen's research and writing focuses on globalization, including social, economic, and political dimensions, immigration, global cities, which include cities and terrorism, the new network technologies and changes within the liberal state that result from current transnational uh, conditions. In one of our most recent books, uh, Expulsions, which I highly recommend, uh, Sassen draws surprising connections to the eliminate the systemic logic of the expulsions from professional life, from living space, even from the very biosphere that makes life possible. So without further ado, Saskia. Okay, thank you. That was a very, very generous uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. I sort of enjoyed it. Um, well, I, want to, I wanted to talk and I really enjoyed the prior talk. I actually arrived just as you were beginning to talk, but I, I thought it was excellent. Uh, what I want to address is the whole question of how does complexity produce brutality because we tend to think of complexity as something that is really valuable that is serious that is good uh, now for me part of the answer and it's my it's an argument you don't have to agree with me but part of the uh, part of the answer concerns the logics that are organizing some of today's major order making systems and these systems operate in domains as diverse as global environmental uh, issues protections of certain actors high finance so it's a very long spectrum a very uh, strong spectrum 
of all kinds of complex systems that somehow are in play today and they do change what it means to understand what is happening. Now, if I wanted to illustrate just very briefly uh, my argument, uh, I want to work on two cases which I have developed at length and here I will just be very brief. A key policy innovation uh, in interstate agreements aiming at protecting the environment is of course carbon trading. So I find this a very, very interesting sort of contradiction almost if you want. Uh, this means practically and brutally speaking that countries will tend to fight for expanding their right to pollute so as to either buy or sell a bigger quota of carbon emissions. You understand what I'm saying, right? The whole question of controlling these, car these, these emissions is that the actors behind it actually get to play a role in all of that. And, and so it's quite, and, and, and thus it's going to be very easy for many of them to sort of be grabby, grabby, grabby. By grabby, I mean something very negative. Um, so a key, again, a key policy innovation uh, in these interstate agreements, I repeat, which aim at protecting the environment, et cetera, et cetera, is carbon trading. We all know about that. Uh, this means practically and brutally speaking, I repeat, that countries will tend to fight for expanding their right to pollute. This is what is happening now, which is a contradiction that we didn't want. So as to either buy or sell a bigger quota of carbon emissions, because they have been granted that option, they can buy and sell. And so they can, they can sort of control the game to a much larger extent than they should. Uh, now, in the case of finance, which is a subject that I have done a lot of work on, uh, it's organizing logic. The logic that, that, that lies behind high finance has evolved into a sort of relentless push, uh, a push for hyper profits and a need to develop instruments that enable it to expand the range of what can be financialized. So we're talking here about the financial system. Uh, that has led to a willingness to financialize even the livelihoods of those who lose everything if the instrument backfires. In other words, it has opened up a vast uh, set of options for all kinds of actors where there will be some winners and some who will not be winners. Now, uh, uh, so, so that they're, they're actually financializing all kinds of things. I mean, it's just almost unimaginable a few years ago that this could be possible. Now, for instance, one, one example is, of course, the famous case. I have done a lot of work on that, and you've heard me say it. The, the famous subprime mortgage that was launched, I mean, 20 years ago in the United States. And what is still misunderstood, I would argue, is that this was a financial project. This didn't have to do with providing housing for millions of people. No, it just it said that it was about that, but it wasn't. Uh, so again, what is perhaps still misunderstood is that this was a financial project aimed at profits for high finance. So the whole notion of all these modest little houses that had to be built to enable, yes, they did a lot of that, but that had nothing to do with what we think nowadays of you know really providing housing. Now, the story is a bit complicated, so I'm not going to dwell on that. It, it's just a stunning event where just millions of households fell in a sort of trap. Um, so, so in a way, then we could say that it was the opposite of the state project that was launched decade earlier. You know, when you had the, G, the GI Bill in the United States, you had in many countries in a slightly earlier period, you had a real disposition among the leadership uh, uh, to help the poorer classes because there was a sense, I'm thinking now, especially about Latin America also, but, but also the United States, it was a sense that we could help, you know, we can, we can make, we can eliminate a lot of the extreme poverty. 
uh, well, it, to some extent that was happened, but it very quickly fell in the hands of these more financialized actors, and then you have a problem. Now, the, the, the sort of the capacities, if you want, that furthered the development of these systems and these innovations are not necessarily, these capacities are not necessarily intrinsically brutalizing. No, that can be positive. But when they function within particular types of organizing logics, and that's the issue, then they are brutal and then they are very problematic. So it starts, it, if you want, potentially it could be a positive. You know, you build a million new housing for modest income people. That's fine, that's not too bad. But if you have a very specialized sector such as high finance, which can transform anything, a potato, a banana, a house into an asset-backed security. That is the issue where you lose the visual of the potato, the this, the that, you know, this is a totally abstract condition. That is very difficult. When that sector can expand its power over just about everything, uh, then we have a problem. And that is exactly what really began to happen. And this is the story that, that started 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I have a terrible strong sun here on me. Um, now, there is, a, there is a kind of, I would argue, there is a kind of social conundrum in play in all of this. These capacities should have served to develop the social realm, uh, to broaden and strengthen the well-being of a society, which includes working with the biosphere, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all the good things, the, the things that, that, that could really add something. Um, instead, what happened is that they have too often served to dismember the social through extreme inequality. In other words, a brutal outcome, and I repeat, huh? to broaden and strengthen the well-being of a society, which includes working with a biosphere, all of that was simply overwhelmed, put aside, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened was a kind of dismembering of the social, uh, the social condition through extreme inequality to destroy much of the middle-class life promised by liberal democracy. Let's remember that. Uh, to expel the vulnerable and the poor from land is what really happened. So they were expelled. It was even worse than, than, than it had been. Um, and, and in a way, for me, there is also a whole issue that's a sort of a separate channel about how that affected also climate change and the whole question of health, et cetera, et cetera. So there are multiple, it's not just poverty as in not having good food, it is a, it's a broader complex than that. Now, a question running for me through all of this subject is whether the mix of cases that I sort of analyzed in this, in this case, um, which <clears throat> in many ways cuts across what are familiar divisions. So it, instead of accepting these notions of divisions, I actually want to bring those divisions into the discussion. That can get a bit problematic if you want, um, because it's sort of, it's, it's not the, the familiar mode. Um, now, you know, what, what we have is a sort of systemic dynamics that operate at, and I like this notion, that operate at a subterranean level. And that is why they can get away with murder because it's so complex that the average person simply will not understand what is happening. But there they are and they are actually transforming what we might see, for instance, as the building of new housing, et cetera, et cetera, in the hands of these actors changes. It's not simply building new housing. It is also an extracted mode, and, and that, that makes it, of course, a bit more, more abstract, a bit more complex, but there it is. Um, so I, I repeat, these systemic dynamics operate 
at a subterranean level with more to connect them than we can sort of the connections are very strong so many many connections uh, so to connect them then we can grasp when we divide the world into familiar discrete categories etc cetera, etc cetera. capitalist economy Co uh, economies, communist China, sub-Saharan Africa, the environment question, finance, et cetera, et cetera. We use all of these labels uh, to give a familiar meaning to conditions that originate in deeper, unfamiliar trends. I don't know, so this is, this is a whole new world that can play with us in ways that we don't even notice. Now, this this possibility that that we are is, is a key driver uh, for me in many many of the analyses that I'm doing because I see that we need to we need to get into those complex systems in order to understand how they are abusing uh, their powers in many ways uh, now so when I use this notion of subterranean trends as a shorthand for what are strictly speaking, uh, you know, a whole series of conceptually uh, de developed subterranean trends. It's not that they are not visible; they are. But the, but there is a there is something. Yes, the building exists; we can see it. But there's something else that is also in play, and that is really what, for me, bec becomes the important issue because there is a kind of invisibility that attaches to very powerful actors. And in this case, it's about the housing question. It's not just about, you know, wealth or grabbing. Uh, now, one domain where they, some of these elements really are perhaps a bit more visible is the question of the environment. I have found that very interesting. We know that we are using and destroying the biosphere, right? It's not that we are not aware of that. We are aware of that. But our environmental policies do not connect with, uh, with or reflect, if you want, a clear understanding of the actual condition of the biosphere. <clears throat> Does, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Does carbon trading and famous case, of course, carbon trading as a way of protecting the environment makes sense only from an interstate perspective. Yet little sense, but it makes little sense from a planetary perspective, uh, where local destructions scale up and hit us all. So you have a, an engagement with the, 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 the little <clears throat> with the little elements, but really when you take the full spectrum, then you have entered a new zone and that zone is not favoring us, us, the analyst, us, the critics, et cetera, et cetera. I think you can tell that I'm a bit ill, so I apologize for uh, my interruptions here. Now, we can also think, and I want to begin to conclude, this is a bit of uh, heavy, heavy stuff I can see, uh, new, there are sort of new dy dynamics that uh, may well get filtered through familiar thick realities, poverty, inequality, economy, etc., etc., and thereby take on familiar forms. In other words, we feel, oh yeah, we recognize it. But in fact, they are signaling accelerations or ruptures that generate new meanings. In other words, what we may be presented as, oh yes, nice, familiar, we understand. Actually, there are other vectors in play, other actors in play, other intentions in play, and those are not as visible as you know, the visible ones. And they are, of course, sources of great power. Now, I just want to begin to conclude because I know this is a bit heavy. So using the notion of subterranean trends and subterranean trends, that which we cannot quite see, is one way of calling into question familiar categories for organizing knowledge about our economies, our societies, and our interaction with the biosphere. 
it helps us assess, eh, understand, measure uh, whether today's problems are extreme versions of old troubles or manifestations of something or some things disturbing. Um, I'm sorry here, and no. In other words, we are caught up in a situation where we know that certain things are happening, but we cannot fully understand, we cannot fully control. And high finance is, of course, the queen of the domain on that. Um, now, in, in, in some of my work, I have really tried to explore whether the sheer variety of expulsions of all sorts, in other words, negative for most of the people. Uh, so it helps us if that, you know, that, that, that our interacting with the biosphere, huh? if it helps us assess whether today's problems, I repeat, are extreme versions of old troubles, old, you know, conditions that have long existed, or are they manifestations of something disturbing and new? I explore in my own research <coughs> this kind of issue. <coughs> and so I, I also want to know, for instance, whether the sheer variety of expulsions that are taking place obscure, hide, if you want, larger, more encompassing, subterranean dynamics, subterranean in the sense that we don't quite see them. It's not that they are invisible, but we cannot see them. We cannot understand fully what is happening. So I repeat, I, in, my, in my research, I'm exploring whether the sheer variety, huh, the variety of expulsions that are taking place are actually hiding, if you want, larger, more encompassing subterranean dynamics that may underlie that variety at ground level. I think we are really dealing in these complex systems with levels. Some levels are visible and we may think, ah, there, there it is, we can see it. Whereas in fact, there are layers and layers that are not visible to us. So, you know, when we, when we did carbon mining, et cetera, those were visible events. Now we have in, in high finance, a lot of stuff that is not visible. It has outcomes, it makes a difference, but it's not visible. And I think I want to leave you with that, not, not very happy <laughs> sentence, but uh, it sort of captures, I think, the, the challenges that we face. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Saskia. <laughs> <clears throat> um. That leaves me uh, in the last place after Saskia, it would be a bit hard. Subterraneous. Uh, so yeah. Um, I just want to, um, I just want to introduce two ideas, basically, which I have worked on in my chapter and which I'm working on now. So basically, on the one hand, the idea that there is such a thing as urban bouldering, okay? And on the other hand, the idea of everyday bouldering. So, Basically, um, what I've been trying to do in, in this research that I've been published in here in this book and also the book which is coming forward in, in half a year uh, is to ground this more global framework, which, uh, for instance, Saskia has, has been talking about here, uh, and which we've heard about, you know, and, and from the introduction and in, in, in Natalia's work. Um, so uh, what I tried to is to scrutinize what we might call bouldering practices on the ground, okay? Or on the ground or in space, in relation to space or in space. So basic, basically how people negotiate social boundaries, group boundaries, okay? In the chapter, uh, although, I mean, obviously here I won't go into detail because uh, I'll just give you a little teaser and leave it to yourself to kind of go into depth with it. Uh, also because I don't really feel I have enough time to explain it fully. Um, I plan what the Lebanese uh, Australian anthropologist Hassan Hagi uh, in his marvelous book, which I really encourage you to read, uh, called White Nation, 
called spatial management, okay? Which is basically how some bodies uh, are and feel entitled to manage, which uh, in, in include, exclude, expose, move around, uh, and at large, uh, et cetera, other bodies, okay, within the space. So in other words, in my book and chapter, what we see is how those considered native become managers of the social, be that the neighborhood, the school, social services, and so on. And so on. what I scrutinize is how belonging is questioned, negotiated in and through spatial practices and discourses over space. Now, one might argue that who is considered native or local somehow relates to a larger framework, which we are looking here, of citizenship, belonging, and more importantly, the nation or the national subject. Uh, this is one of the reasons why actually this framework is very compelling, because it allows to analyze and study uh, and also articulate these uh, local global dynamics operating in any, any given field uh, of study. And at the same time, it lay, lies there those processes which often go unnoticed, uh, such as the inherent ideas of who belong and how that relates to gender, class, and more importantly, in my case, race and ethnicity. So the framework I propose of urban bordering uh, go beyond administrative exclusion and labor segregation to include housing exclusion and constant exposure to police violence in certain areas of space. Now I'm still developing this. Uh, so in my current research, I'm gonna find the idea uh, inherent to the concept laid forward by Yuval Davis, where Mills and Cassidy and their research on bouldering, uh, published in the book Bouldering, called Bouldering, uh, of everyday bouldering. So basically in, in this book, they deal with the ways how landlords, for instance, in the UK, how landlords and employers have having increasingly uh, uh, become border agents who have to check uh, the documents or documentation of the future tenants and employees. Okay? Um, from this, from this idea of everyday bouldering, I take the, the focus on middlemen. So in this case, we're talking about landlords and employers. I take this focus on the middlemen. And in Denmark, I study how middlemen, in this case, we're talking about civil servants, urban planners, housing associations uh, representatives deal with uh, the legislation, also known as the anti-ghetto law. On the other hand, in Catalonia, I study how real estate agents, solicitors, and judges negotiate the right to stay or not through the application of foreclosure, as opposed to the right of housing. Um, the aim with all this is how, to scrutinize how these middlemen conceive of space and social spatial arrangements in terms of who belong and who doesn't. How do they construe belonging in space or to space? So for instance, in Denmark in 2018, a parallel society legislation uh, was introduced to push forward in the dismantling of certain areas uh, seen as problematic. Okay? These were cooperative, partially state-funded housing areas. Now, although the classification on which this itself is, is, is founded is itself very problematic, it, well, it relies on certain uh, factors, such as, I mean, socioeconomic factors, crime statistics, and education, the actual decisive factor is whether or not there are more than 40% of people with a non-Western background, which basically includes people of second generation as well. So focus is here on how the middlemen implement this legislation in practice. So although um, it's still at an early age, I have an observation or some observation I want to share with you here, and which I hope, in, uh, hope to kind of open up for the biggest one. In the case of Denmark, it's interesting to see that a whole variety of uh, politicians civil servants will a large part of representatives of these housing associations and workers in the nonprofit housing sectors agree on uh, that there are certain problems in these areas related to crime, culture, and poverty. The only thing is that they diverge on the origins of these. And the solution is basically a more mixed city or spatial distribution, which entails attracting middle class white or ethnic Danes to the nonprofit housing sector and pushing the low income, often but not always, other ethnics away. 
And as a consequence, the only subjects catered for in the proposal are, I mean, proposal two solution of these, are the natives, the decided subjects. Whereas the others can, are seen to be a, I mean, they're seen that they can be moved around without listening or deliberating on their desires or needs. So basically the idea is that certain people are managing space to, with, with, with certain ideas in mind of who belong and who want to go, okay? That's kind of the idea of late, I'll just leave it here. Um, I myself highly can recommend this book. I think it's a very interesting transnational, transregional, transdisciplinary overview on work on borders, border regimes, border crossings, and in general, a very interesting, uh, I think, introduction to the variety of debates and setting. It is truly, as Natalia said herself, a global in its outlook, covering areas from America and general to uh, to both North and South, uh, to Africa, Asia, and Europe. So I really applaud that diversity and and views. And thank you very much for being here. And I think we can open up for any questions. Should there be any amongst the audience here? So thank you. Anybody? Thank you. Oh, thanks so much for the great presentation. And thank you, Martin, for your chapter over there. We look forward to reading that book. Yes. So I have questions to the editors of this book on the title of the book, which highlights human security. And obviously, that's a theme that came up in the presentation as well. And I guess my question relates to your normative views on this kind of uh, juxtaposition between state power and migrant agency that you talked about. And it sounded to me, if I understood correctly, that the state was presented as an actor that seeks to, as Timothy Dunn put it, securitize migration. And we can highlight the agency of migrants seeking a better life, for instance, as something that kind of challenges that framing and highlights things like human dignity instead. But given that general normative framing, I'm a bit surprised then to see human security be the term chosen to highlight the, what I would think of as the human dignity side of that, something that can challenge the state framing of border control. I know that quite a while ago now, Ken Booth wrote this article on security and emancipation where human security was put forward as a kind of progressive emancipatory way of thinking through security. But I think that since then, a few decades of critical security research has kind of highlighted how even when we try to frame security in progressive terms, we still buy into the logic of security, which ends up being very state-centric, territorializing. And I think contemporary, contemporary context in the UK is a good example of one where human security in the channel crossings, as by the current Home Secretary, I think been completely instrumentalized in terms of push pushbacks in the channel, criminalizing irregularly arriving asylum seekers in the name of protecting their security from organized crime or whatever. You know, the only reason, as Pretty Patel said, the only reason that people migrate irregularly is organized crime. And I think that human security, even when it tries to be emancipatory, has a risk of kind of buying into that logic. So my question relates to the choice of the term human security for those reasons. Okay. Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I, it, Tim, is he, is he around, Tim, no? Maybe, yeah. Just to, because he, he knows about this question also. Yeah, is he there? Yeah. No, I'll answer, but I mean, I think he can uh, follow me up afterwards. You know, you caught me because talking of, uh, about the uh, L the publishers who are here, you know, I, uh, I didn't choose uh, this uh, title. It was uh, the publishers wanted to put human security. This was so me, and I don't know, it was, uh, it was something, borders, something about borders and migration. I don't remember which one was my title originally, but they insisted that they wanted to, to put human security. And me, I, I never work on human security. So all these, Many things, many of these topics that I talk, I've worked and I know, but I never use this concept of human security. 
But then in the introduction, I don't know if uh, Tim was there, it's Tim who, who, uh, who collected all the information about human security. Yeah. Eh? So you, you, you can answer to this concept of human security. I answer it to him quickly, and then you can continue with the human security part that you, you did work uh, a little bit more. Really, I didn't like it so much uh, the, to use this concept, and especially on the title, but I mean, they insisted and I, and I, and I accepted. So you, you've seen the, the trick here, no? It's interesting also. Anyway, and this contradict the agency and the structure, I think it's been like a, you know, it's a, a common area of research for sociologists and anthropologists, no? So we, we, we used to have the a structural framework and then there was never a, a way to breathe, no? But about the agency and, you know, like a, in the last uh, 20 years, I think uh, research on agency has developed so much. And particularly, you know, then in migration studies, then they started all this uh, work on, on networks and how networks, you know, were bringing agency. And of course, in this, uh, you know, these uh, conditions of closed borders for some kind of, uh, of people, of course, no? In this filtering of borders, you know, the agency was the only thing left when there's no way it's always a, a matter of inventing reinventing and agency i think as tim said no i think he's, mm -hmm. he used this very beautiful expression no? the the creative agency of the of the activists or something like that so it's so they if you see how ngos work at border they they, they always have to invent and reinvent you have to be really uh, have an artist in order to, to be an activist, no? So I think, yeah, that's uh, very clear to me that it's like between this uh, structural, you know, state power and the agency. And this agency, you can connect it also with globalization forms also, because I mean, this agency comes also in, in networks, in diaspora, et cetera, in a, in a mode of a grassroots movements of these global borders, no? And I don't know, Tim, if, if you if you are there, you can talk about human security. Yeah. See, is it there? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not saying uh, he's talking. Wait. Tell him. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I uh, muted myself and then had to be unmuted. Thank you, Martin, for playing uh, director here. Um, you know, I, I didn't fully hear the question uh, because of, you know, the, the audio wasn't picking up all of that, but I, I think I get the general gist of the question. It's like the use of human security as a concept, uh, as, as, as a reaction to the, you know, the national security dominant frameworks as a kind of more humanitarian human rights centered alternative uh, itself is problematic, right? It, it kind of buys into this sort of state centered uh, framework, right? I think is is part of what I'm hearing, and you know, I think that's a. That I agree with Natalia. Uh, I I didn't come at this from a human security scholarship background. I'm more of a human rights uh, person and looking at the relationship between human rights and bureaucracy, particularly in border enforcement and immigration enforcement. Um, and human security is, is, is a concept developed out of human rights kind of framework. It's, it's got its roots in that, you know, according to the, the early authors. So I find that, you know, to be helpful. But I, I do take, um, because I want to have human rights in the, in the center of our consideration. Um, and human security is, is one way to kind of help do that. But I, I certainly take to heart the criticism that it really kind of buys into that state-centered framework, and um, you know, really, uh, it's it's it kind of can limit what you can do, right? Um, analytically and otherwise, I think that's a very fair criticism. On the other hand, I do think state power, as well as corporate power, you know, bureaucratic power of all types generally. Uh, getting into the very complexities of it and the the logics behind it as as uh, Saskia was doing is, is extremely important. And I think having those in the center of our discussion as well is important because they generally, you know, I come at it from a position of these things need to be critiqued. And um, 
you know, maybe that gives the, too much attention to the structure and, and can take away from, you know, human agency and other important parts of the analysis. But I, um, and I, I, I am very leery of the securitization of everything. Um, I, I think that is, you know, a very fair concern as well. Um, but yeah, that's a much bigger debate. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I know Dante wants to Yeah, Sarkia, did you want to? Uh, yes, sure. I would love to. I really enjoyed what I have heard so far, and um, I mean, I do think we we are in a in a sort of we are in a complex moment, and um, and we have some very good positive elements in play. You know, the whole question of climate change and protecting the environment, et cetera, et cetera, which is really important, and the younger generations are are really a lot of them are into that. Um, at the same time, we are burdened from many, many old pasts. You know, that is something that is when you think about it in those terms, it's quite amazing. You know, now some of that has been great. It has enabled our intelligences. It has led to great texts and books, but you know, there is, we are dragging, so to say, across the epochs, vast amounts of stuff that is old, that we don't need, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, I mean also that people like me who write a lot, we are also contributing to those unnecessary you know, uh, elements probably. So, so it raises then in my mind a question as to what is the way in which we, we in this epoch, with all its messiness, with all its imperfections, et cetera, et cetera, what is it that we can contribute? You know, and, and when you think about it that way, you realize how little probably we contribute. I don't mean we authors, eh? I mean we people. Now, this is a broad spectrum. And, and, and then, and then you want to ask, then I ask myself at least, <clears throat> I, think, I think of past histories, our past histories, where extraordinary buildings were built, you know, innovations were done. Think of water systems that were invented, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, so many things. And I look at our current period and I see far more negatives than positives. You know, I really have a sense that that uh, we are losing the plot a bit, uh, and it's not because of us, who are probably in 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 many ways uh, a smallish huh, uh, uh, group. Um, I don't mean de facto here. I mean in general. You know, the ones who are really caring about the environment really uh, are are preoccupied with how things are going, and. Um, and there, for me, the new younger generations uh, are a very significant actor. And I do think that they will change a few things. Every generation has done that. But in the past, we have produced so many uh, not so positive elements. You know, the, the engagement with a car, everybody had to own a car and that kind of stuff, you know, just to mention a simple, familiar example. And, and so the, the, the young generations of the current period, there is a growing number, I, I, I find, that are a promise of the future. But they will need support, you know, it won't fall from the sky. And, and um, but we, I, I just wonder, for instance, you know, how we can extend, uh, amplify these kinds of issues so that everybody really becomes aware of some things. I mean, in the United States, the United States is of course a pretty extreme case. In the United States, you really have a lot of people who are, who are not worried at all, who think that everything is fine. And that is truly alarming, I would say. That is not a good sign. Um, and, and at the same time, we have many innovations that are going to be very, very productive. 
and that are going to make for a better world. Huh? So it's this combination of elements that we're living with. And for me, one question is, can we support in very, very strong ways the, the positive innovations, the positive mode of thinking about it, you know, something that protects the environment, et cetera. Um, and can we sort of begin to reduce those elements that we really don't need, that are really negatives, that we really want to eliminate? Uh, it's very difficult to eliminate all kinds of conditions that we can all recognize that they're problematic, but they have existed for a long time. And to eliminate that in our complex societies is not an easy game. That is a very tough one. And again, for me, it's the young generations, you know, who can make a difference that my generation, when, when we were young, we were not very aware of some of the issues that are in play today. So, so anyhow, th those are some of the issues that I really, really care about. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions online? Any here? Here? Mm -hmm. I don't think there are any questions. In the audience here? Could I ask you a yeah. question? Yeah. Um, uh, I was really interested in your description of the, the sort of concept of everyday bordering and I think um, just sort of from my own research and also thinking about the research that people like Mary Bowser have done on outsourcing in uh, the immigration control system, there's always this sort of very interesting tension between how people who are engaged in practices of bordering but aren't directly employed by the state or aren't directly sort of identified as border guards mm -hmm. negotiate their sort of status as as border, as, as people engaged in some way in the practice of border. Yeah. And I, so I wonder if you could talk perhaps just briefly about, you know, sort of how that tension has come out in your research on sort of everyday bordering practices in, in Spain and Denmark. Yeah, well, 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 yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Tom, for that question. Uh, very nice of you. Um, I think that basically the t that there's a tension, there are many tensions, and you kind of, uh, how you deal with with a lot of legal frameworks such as uh, for instance in Denmark the, the ghetto legislation um and but the thing that is most surprising that's why I like every day as a concept is that as like very much like everyday racism is something that you don't really think too much about it's not like it's something you do it's some, just something you have to do in a way so this kind of an appeal of an obligation of little agency, you know, you have to kind of move around within the space that, that the state of the legislation such as, uh, put forward, you know, and then they kind of do, they try to make, and that might connect to the, the politics of compassion, they try to make the best within that. Uh, what, so, so they kind of, so it's really interesting because they, they assume that the violence that they then exercise and by not, for instance, listening or not thinking about these people because that's just how the law is, you know, then that's okay because they cannot do it. They cannot do anything you know, about it. So they assume that violence and exercise it. So I think that relates maybe back again to Aaron and kind of the, or maybe <laughs> Bauman and, and the idea of, you know, this kind of uh, institutional violence is something you just exercise and you have to do in a way, and normalize and naturalize, and therefore it is. The most, more for me, I think that's the most interesting part because I, <coughs> you, make it, you find these, so you find these, uh, you find these um, inherent ideas of, of who is actually the, the, the one you should get you from. Mm -hmm. I think that is interesting, you know, because it's not such, it's not. So I'm not working on those who have paper, or do not fulfill all these administrative uh, paper work, but more the people who are actually in the state, you know, and still. You cannot completely uh, say that they're outside, but they're constantly being drawn as without, I mean, so it's a group without, with, not within, but as not part of that uh, citizenry, you know? And I think, I find that interesting, you know? Because when we talk to people, they're surprised, they don't really think about this. So they openly talk about uh, these issues and, and what, are, what are their kind of ideas about it. They don't really see it as problematic at all. Thank you very much. Anyway, I think we have uh, run out of time. So 
I just like to thank you all very much. Thank, thank you to Saskia for joining us. Uh, thank you to Tim thank as you very well. Much. Uh, thank you to Natalia, you know, for coming here, for presenting your talk and, and, and offering this moment, you know, of debate on a variety of issues. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to you. Um. <laughs>